Yes, good morning to you, Colin, as well. Yeah, and good morning, Boreta, everybody. It's, it's good to see you. A very, very warm welcome on this beautiful uh, summer's morning. Um, I've got to say, after all these years as Siloam's minister, I've never seen you look so happy. <laughs> but it really is good to see each and every one of you. So shall we have the announcements? So thanksgiving and farewell. Um, I think, does it say good riddance there as well? Yes. Um, so that's at five o'clock this evening. Um, right, the Bible study. We're uh, beginning a series on James, I understand, 7.15 on Tuesday. A very warm welcome to everyone. Shop Shabbat. Wednesday at midday and the prayer meeting, the weekly prayer meeting, 7.15 in the school room, I understand, yeah, that's fine. <coughs> and then forget me not, both meetings in Siloam this week, usual time and place. And there's a deacons and trustees meeting five for a 5.30 start on Thursday. And the ladies by the study Rachel will be leading that this coming Friday, uh, the 2nd of August at 2 o'clock. A warm welcome to all the ladies there. And next Sunday morning there'll be a communion service. So that's at 11 o'clock next Sunday morning. And thank you ever so much for supporting the charity of the year, the Key Hope Centre, Diochem Aulian, and also um, the Romanian Aid Foundation supporting the Ukraine. There's always bags in the back. You're ever so kind, as indeed you are with the Food Bank. Thank you for your support there. Fellowship news. Well, there it has been quite a time for you again, hasn't it? Dudley uh, has been in hospital for surgery and then having to be rushed back in for emergency surgery, but he is getting better and that's great to hear. And Marley is, um, well, you've had the, uh, the job of looking after her quite a bit, haven't you? Um, these last few days. Well, very best wishes to Dudley and to all the family. We continue to uphold them in prayer. Co bendith inui eid. Um, uh, Ray, or Roy, I keep mixing up. Uh, Roy uh, isn't with us this morning. Uh, not feeling special. Keith, still on the mend, slowly. Yeah, yeah, no, that's absolutely fine. He's slowly on the mend, isn't he? Anybody else I need to mention? Claire, uh, Claire's mother, um, she's been in hospital in Leeds and Claire has been very much going uh, back and forth to Leeds, hasn't she? How are things? Much the same. Much the same. Well, our prayers are with um, Claire's mum and indeed with Claire with all the travelling up uh, uh, <coughs> and down from Leeds. But I can't think of anyone else. No. So shall we begin with a word of prayer. Lord of the Heavenly Father, we are here to worship you and we need Jesus to be at the centre of our thoughts now. So Lord, we pray that you would help us through your spirit to keep our eyes firmly fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. For we ask in his precious name. Amen. Amen. Well, Steph, you are Thank you very much indeed for uh, <coughs> serving us this morning. And we're going to sing together to God be the glory. <laughs>
Well, Dior Memorial, thank you very much indeed. So our reading comes from the book of Psalms and Psalm 131. My heart is not proud, O Lord. My eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me. <coughs> but I have stilled and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel, put your hope in the Lord, both now and forevermore. And we give thanks to God for his holy and precious word. So, shall we approach his throne together with our prayers? Let us pray. Indeed, Lord, we have sung to God be the glory. Great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son. And it's our privilege this morning, Lord, like every Sunday, to gather together to give glory and praise to you for all you have done for us, for all you continue to do for us, and all that you will do for us. But of course, the greatest of all these things is giving us your son who will fully went to the cross for us and we just ask that as we worship you this morning lord you would remind us once more through your spirit the greatness of the things that happened on that cross where the prince of glory died Thank you that he left his father's throne above so free, so infinite his grace, emptied himself of all but love and bled for Adam's helpless race. We thank you that it is mercy all. And we thank you that indeed when we reflect upon our relationship with you we know that where sin has increased your grace has increased all the more lord you love us with an everlasting love and we thank you we thank you for such amazing love and we thank you that your love extends to the whole of creation and we think especially of our brothers and sisters that are being persecuted in your name today yes lord we know that even during a momentous event like the opening <coughs> ceremony of the Olympics, your name is mocked. But Lord, we thank you that your love for this world remains the same. And Lord, we just pray, we just pray that more and more people in this land of ours will stop will be still and know that you are God and will know what you have done for them. So Lord, we ask your blessing upon each and every one of us, not just today, but in the weeks and months and years ahead. May your name continue to be glorified. And Lord, we pray especially for those that are unwell 
at this time. There are those that would love to be here this morning, but ill health and other circumstances haven't allowed them to be here. So we pray for them. We pray for those dear to us. And we ask again your forgiveness for all our sins. For we ask in the precious name of Jesus who taught us when praying to offer this prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Well, we continue with our worship through singing the second hymn, Here is Love Vast as the Ocean. Four verses. Oh, there are four verses. There are four verses, apparently. Diochomorium. Very familiar 
words I'm sure to all of us unless the Lord builds the house the builders labor in vain unless the Lord builds the house the builders labor in vain now there are three simple things in this uh, in these words um, just three simple things first of all we have a house or we have a temple if you like unless the Lord builds the house now when Solomon built the very first temple he said these words will God really dwell on earth the heavens even the highest heaven cannot contain you how much less this temple I have built when he considered the greatness of God <coughs> as splendid and as big that first temple was he realized how tiny it was how minute it was compared to the greatness of God how much less this temple I have built but it was still a special place that symbolized God's presence with his people it was a place where sacrifices would be offered for the people's sins and where the people of Israel regardless of social distinctions and tribal <coughs> jealousies would gather to offer prayers and praise to God it was a place where people and even property would be consecrated for God's service and it was a place where God would reveal himself and a place where the people would be reminded of God's law so how is this relevant to us today well as we know Solomon's temple was destroyed and every temple was destroyed in time there after but the church the Christian church that is everyone who has received Jesus as their Lord and Savior is now God's temple you and I, dear friends, here at Siroa and the Christian Church, everybody who has accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Saviour, well, they, we, you and I, are God's temple. But the church isn't just a symbol of God's presence. God genuinely dwells within us that's the difference God genuinely dwells within us this is what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you and in Ephesians chapter 2 he said in him you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit and those words that Jesus spoke where two or three gather in my name there am I with them but notice dear friends notice the words together and gather doesn't that prove that whenever possible Christians are meant to be yeah. together but for the temple like any building to stand firm it needed to be built on a firm foundation and cornerstone and the same is true of the church isn't it again in Ephesians chapter 2 Paul said that the church is built on the foundation of the Apostles and prophets 
with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. And this simply means, dear friends, that the church must be built on what the Bible teaches about Jesus. The whole Bible points to him, but most specifically his sacrifice on the cross, where the sins of all who call on the name of the Lord are taken away, and the church everywhere is called to proclaim this message. Now, social distinctions inevitably, inevitably exist in every society, don't they, sadly? But Christians must lay these distinctions aside and worship the one true God as he dwells and pray to him in the name of Jesus and through the power of the Holy Spirit. And as we prayerfully read his word, we allow the Holy Spirit to help us, as Paul said to the church in Rome, chapter 12, to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. This is the purpose of the church to make clear God's way of salvation through Jesus Christ and to provide opportunities for Christians to worship and grow in faith and to do this in the strength of the Holy Spirit. Now, dear friends, now, let's think of our chapels. Let's think of our chapel buildings for a moment. Our chapel buildings have long been a very important part of the life of the church in our country. A lot of history and sentiment are attached to them, naturally. They are places where so many Christians first knew the Lord. And therefore, it's quite natural that they have a special place in the affections of so many people. Bethlehem, my home church, or my mother church, if you like, had a very special place in my affections. And I was deeply saddened when it finally closed. They are more <coughs> than just bricks and mortar. However, we must remember that our chapels were built by our Christian forefathers to accommodate and facilitate the God-given purpose of the church. When chapel buildings accommodate and facilitate the proclaiming of the gospel and the building up of the faith of Christians, where well, they are a blessing and play an important role in the growth of God's kingdom. But when our aging chapels and the cost of their maintenance become the primary focus of the church and a drain on its God-given resources, they cease to fulfil the purpose for which they were built. They become a hindrance and not a help to the expansion of the kingdom. They cease to be a blessing and become a burden. Indeed, not just a burden, but a curse. Jesus once said, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. 
We read those words in John chapter 2. Now he was referring to the death and resurrection of his own body. Yet his disciples' focus was so much on the temple building that three years would pass before they realised to what Jesus was really referring. Such was their fixation on the building. The sad thing is, indeed it's a tragedy, that despite such focus on the preservation of chapel buildings, most have ended up closing anyway, and they are still closing at an alarming rate in our country. It's a painful question, but a question that must be asked, and a question only you can answer. Is the same thing happening to Siloam? Has the building, which has been such a blessing in the past, now become a burden and a hindrance to the purpose for which it was built? Now I may be wrong, but I believe that the day of old chapel buildings being effective instruments for God's work has largely ended. And radical and prayerful thinking is needed as to how the church and its God-given purpose can most effectively be accommodated. So that's the first of our focuses this morning, the house, the temple, but secondly, unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labour in vain. We have builders. We have builders. Now, where we live, there have been several building projects. Um, hundreds of houses have popped up and are popping up everywhere. And you see an army of people with different skills working together. Bricklayers, plasterers, roofers, joiners, painters and decorators, electricians, plumbers, labourers, and many more, all working together to build safe and sound buildings. Different skills, but the same purpose. Now, every Christian is a builder. God has given us all, all skills, that is, gifts, to build up his church. Listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them, and in everyone, in everyone, not just some, but in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now to each one, again, I emphasize, to each one, not some, not most, but to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. Now even though we might have a particular gift or gifts, we must still be at hand to help others, if required. Let's go back to the building site for a moment. If the bricklayer sees the joiner 
in yet of a hand, he offers it, doesn't he? And if the joiner is sensible, he gladly accepts. However, problems will arise if the joiner is too proud to receive the bricklayer's help. Or if the bricklayer thinks he knows the joiner's job better than the joiner himself. And the same is true of us. It's what's best for God and his church <coughs> that matters, isn't it? Now we might be given a gift that we don't particularly want. And we may indeed prefer another gift. We may say to God, why have you given me this gift and not another? We sometimes see reluctant recipients of God's gifts in the Bible, don't we? We may even delude ourselves into thinking that God has given us a gift when he's really given us another. And when we try and exercise the gift we haven't got, then everybody suffers. Now, I don't think I've mentioned this too often over the past 27 or so years. It might come as a surprise to the majority, but I follow the Scarlets. <laughs> Does that come as a surprise? Yeah. You've got every right to feel sorry for me. <laughs> now let's go back to the 1980s. The Scarlets back in the 1980s had a very good player, um, a number seven, an open side flanker or wing forward called David Pickering. Yep, some of you will remember David Pickering, he even uh, captained Wales for uh, a while. But David Pickering, sadly, he was a very good flanker, very good open wing forward, but sadly, Di Pickering, or Di Pick, as we all called him, was obsessed with becoming a number nine, a scrum half, totally different position, right? And he kept nagging Gareth Jenkins, the Scarlet's head coach, to be given a chance at number nine. And he had a few games at number nine, right, at scrum half, and not at number seven. Just for those of you maybe who are a bit stuck here, Gareth Edwards was a number nine, okay? And David Pickering thought that he possibly could be the next Gareth Edwards. It was a disaster, an absolute disaster. We even lost at home to my mistake, right? <laughs> and you had to really, really try very hard indeed to lose at home to my mistake. But with David Pickering at scrum half, the Scarlets managed to do it. He had a good pack in front of him, fantastic backs outside of him, but the whole team suffered. His gift was number seven. He was very good at number seven, and the whole team benefited when he was a number seven. When you stuck him at number nine, the whole team suffered because that wasn't his gift. Let's be grateful and content with the gifts that we have. God doesn't get it wrong. God doesn't get it wrong. As Christians, we consecrate all that we are and all that we have to God. As Peter says in his first epistle, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others. 
as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Are we truly doing this? If not, we are guilty of throwing God's gifts back in his face. We are basically telling our fellow Christians, I don't care about you, I just care about me. Our responsibility, and it's a great responsibility, dear friends, isn't just for us and our generation, but for the generation to come. Now in the Old Testament, there was a king called Hezekiah. On the whole, he was a good king, but he had his flaws, right? And one of his flaws was he was a bit of a show-off. And when his envoys came from Babylon, he showed off. He took them to the temple and took them to the palace and said, look at all the stuff we've got. Look at all the treasures we've got. <clears throat> And what he didn't realize was that they went home to Babylon and said, right, that needs to be on our radar. If we invade that country, all that stuff will be ours. And God spoke to Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord. The time will surely come when everything in your palace and all that your predecessors have stored up until this day will be carried off to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord. And some of your descendants, your own flesh and blood, who will be born to you, will be taken away. And they will become slaves in the palace of the king of Babylon. Now how do you think Hezekiah responded to that with massive regret and repentance with much tears sackcloth and ashes no this was his response the word, the word of the Lord you have spoken is good for he thought will there not be peace and security in my lifetime. As long as I'm alright, who cares about the future? Who cares even about my flesh and blood? As long as I'm alright. That was his attitude. And we all know what happened next. So dear friends, we have a house or a temple, we have builders and we're all builders but finally, dear friends, I thank you so much for listening. We have an architect. Unless the Lord builds the house. Now, one of my favourite landmarks in Wales is the Menai Suspension Bridge. Bonteborth, it's often called in Welsh. My mother is from Hollyhead, Kyle Gubby. And as I've told you many times before, in years gone by, they used to send convicts to Anglesey and psychopaths to Hollyhead. <laughs> um, my mother loves it when I tell her that. So we used to cross always the Menai Bridge. Hardly ever the Britannia Bridge. It had to be the Menai Bridge. Um, it's a beautiful bridge. It really is a beautiful bridge. Bridge and uh, an iconic view, isn't it? Um, and there aren't too many um, places or things in Wales that uh, are, are so often photographed and sketched and painted and so on and so forth. Now, hundreds of people were involved in the construction of the Menai Bridge. Yet, the completed work is attributed to one man, the one who designed it. Do you know who it was? Bruno. What did you say, Jack? 
You said Brunel, did you? Jeff, I've waited a long time to say this. You're wrong. <laughs> Does anybody else want to uh, give a guess? Pardon? Wendy from Cerechi, you're spot on. Thomas Telford. Diane Field, right? It's good to give these jacks an education, isn't it? Yeah. The civil engineer Thomas Telford. Without him, there would have been no design to build upon. And for the temple to be built, Solomon, listen to this, conscripted 30,000 laborers from all Israel. He had 70,000 carriers, 80,000 stone cutters in the hills, and 3,300 four men who supervised the project and directed the workers. All those people involved, thousands, tens of thousands of them. Yet, it's still known as Solomon's Temple. And again, I remind you what he said, but will God really dwell on earth? The heavens, even the highest heavens, cannot contain you. How much less this temple I have built, he said. The nitty gritty was fulfilled by thousands of committed workers. But it wouldn't have been done without Solomon's instigation. Yet, it was God that told Solomon to build it. What does it say there? Um, John Davis, is it? John Davis on the tablet? Wasn't he the one that planted the seed here? John Pugh. John Pugh, is it? John Pugh, forgive me. John Pugh, was that Ivan Woodward? Correcting me again. Who was it? Who shouted out? Me. Who's me? Jim. Jim, sorry, Jim. Sorry, Jim. It's normally Ivan Woodward that corrects me, you know, so uh, that's my fault for being presumptuous. So, John Pugh. <laughs> Pardon? It's on this side. Oh, gosh, all right. It's on this side. John Pugh. John Pugh. Uh, he planted the church, didn't he? And how many people, I wonder, followed John Pugh? Who have we got? We've got, there we are, there is a John Davis, isn't there? Yeah? And um, who else? D.T. Thomas. Barbara's. Well, um, Adopted father, what a story Barbara has. Uh, an evacuee who stayed in, well, in Wales, learnt Welsh, yes, and here she is. And following D.T. Thomas, I think Ali Petty gave two shifts in, didn't he? Yeah. And, pardon? There were lots of people in between. Lots of people in between before Ali Petty that are not named on the. And then Brian Willets, yeah. yes, Brian Willets, and along came this <laughs> youngster <laughs> who was not married at the time, still in his twenties with black hair, yes. um, from Kennehy. So, yeah, John Pym planted all the other people, named and unnamed, watered, but it's God that made Siloam grow. Listen to this. I planted the seed, Paul said. Upon us watered it, but God made it grow. And he goes on to say this. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters are anything, but only God who makes things grow. That's quite a statement, isn't it? John Pym, D.T. Thomas, Petty, Willets, Heinrich Jones. Nothing. Nothing. Unless 
the Lord builds the house. The builders labor in vain. It is God that makes it grow. Trust, dear friends, as we read in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, Apollos says in Hebrews chapter 12. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who, for the joy set before him, endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, for his glory. Amen. And our final hymn this morning, dear friends, All I Once Held Dear. Remain with us now and forevermore. Amen.